Dialogue with a Doctor, featuring Southwest Florida's leading physicians. Hello and welcome to Dialogue with a Doctor. Uh, my name is Dr. Gregory Leach and I'm here this evening, well today, I keep saying this evening, <laughs> a habit, um, with Dr. Uh, Eichten. Dr. Eichten is a board certified orthopedic specialist uh, who's done a fellowship in joint surgery. Uh, hips and knees is his specialty. Um, and we, he, he, you've been on the show before uh, and we want to welcome you back. This is a show where we interview physicians about their craft, how they practice it, uh, to teach you uh, so that you understand what's going on uh, with your own body if you are ever faced with anything like this. So we're going to be talking about the hip replacement um, we've done a show on uh, knee replacement, so if you have, haven't seen that one, you should watch it because it's, it's pretty cool. Dr. Eichten, tell us a little bit about yourself and, and um, where you come from. Well, thanks for having me again. So uh, I grew up in Minnesota, and I keep moving further and further south. <laughs> it's not that I didn't like the winter. It was just a little bit too long. You can't get any farther south <laughs> right. than this, <laughs> and you're not going to Key West. No. So, but we do have practices in Fort Myers and Naples. Uh, after Minnesota, I did my medical school at Kansas City, and then did my orthopedic training in Ohio. Uh, and then I did a joint fellowship here in the Southwest Florida area uh, for an extra year of just hip and knee replacement. Uh, I think that has benefited me as far as, you know, honing in the surgical skills. And then that way patients get better results when I do a joint replacement. It makes for a happier career, happier patients, and more satisfying, you know, work. Mm -hmm. So it's been very helpful. Um, we do have an office in North Naples and in Fort Myers, so we're, we've kind of expanded over the last couple of years. Uh, we've added some new surgeons, and our practice is uh, seven physicians now. So we have, you know, every subspecialty uh, covered. Um, and you, you have a hand specialist and yeah we have a hand specialist one in Naples one in Fort Myers we have a joint specialist two of us and then we have sports medicine and foot and ankle surgeon and then we just added a pain management uh, physician as well hmm. and how okay um, it's interesting to have a pain management physician in an orthopedic practice but actually it makes it very comprehensive yeah and it, since we're talking about hips we do see a lot of patients that have back problems that cross over to the hip. You know, if you come in with the pain and it's radiating to the posterior hip, you could have a low, lower back lumbar pinched nerve. Mm -hmm. So a lot of those patients can now get evaluated within our practice, uh, you know, and sometimes they'll do different modalities to help with that pain. You know, sometimes we get x-rays, the hip looks perfectly normal, and we have to figure out where that pain's coming from. A lot of times it's coming from, you know, arthritis in the lower back. So it's kind of been very helpful, uh, you know, and they can see anybody, you know, head to toe pain and they help different modalities to help with their, with their pain. And they do nerve blocks as well, don't they? Yeah, nerve blocks, they do epidural injections in the neck and the lower back. So it's basically non-operative spine treatment. So we're going to talk about who a candidate for hip surgery is. And before we get into that detail, I know sure. that you're using biologics on the knee. Correct. Stem cells, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and can you use biologics on the hip? So the biologics, we're trying to regenerate cartilage. You can use it on any joint in the body. And we've ejected a lot of different joints. I think we talk about knees more often because we see more knee arthritis in, in uh, this time frame than we do hip arthritis or ankle arthritis. There's just more patients with knee arthritis than any other uh, arthritis. So that being said, we probably treat more knees, but we have injected hips, they have done well. I would say if the cartilage is completely worn out on the hip, you're better off with the hip replacement than spending money on the regenerative medicine. So it depends on what your x-rays look like and what your MRI looks like, you know, as far as the treatment plan. Once the bone completely wears out, there's a lot of pressure in the joint, and you're walking on it every day, there's not a lot of things that are going to help that pain. So most patients will opt for the hip replacement. So 
Would you say that most of the time the biologics are used on the knee and to a lesser degree on the hip? Lesser degree on the hip because by the time they see us, they're already bone on bone. So if you can catch the hip early where it's just mild or moderate arthritis, I think the biologic will play more of a role uh, in that situation. So I can send you patients for that then, sure. so to speak. Yes. So uh, tell us about who does need uh, a hip replaced when? So most commonly patients will say that they, you know, they have pain in their groin or they pulled their groin. They also have pain when they're walking. Uh, some patients walk with the limp. And it's very clear once you get an x-ray, you look at the space in the joint. You know, if, if the cartilage is worn out, you know, and you can see there, that white cartilage covers the end of the bone, the hip joint is a ball and socket. So once the cartilage wears out, you know, then the bone will rub against the bone. You can see that clearly on an x-ray. You know, if you have good cartilage, there'll be a space. If the bone's touching, you'll see that on the x-ray. So if, if your symptoms are not controlled by anti-inflammatories, you can try therapy, you can try injections, uh, then you'd be a candidate for a hip replacement. And when you do the hip replacement, you remove the ball, you get rid of all the arthritis. Uh, and when you replace the joint, uh, the pain goes away pretty quickly. It's just a different type. You have a little bit of pain from the surgery. And it seems that most of my patients who have uh, hip replacement recover much faster than the knee replacement patients. Yeah, and I think that a lot of that has to do with the range of motion. We don't really worry about hips getting stiff. They tend not to get stiff. So your therapy is, you know, working on the muscle strength and walking. With the knee replacement, you get a little bit more swelling, and if you don't move that knee, it's gonna get stiff. So the therapy's very critical for a knee replacement, and it takes a little bit longer for the knee to kind of get the motion back. Uh, once the swelling goes down from the surgery and the pain goes down, it's a lot easier to get the motion. With the hips, we don't really see that, so patients recover a lot quicker. So tell us a little bit about a traditional a traditional hip replacement. So when hips were first developed in the older hips, we have you know, a metal cup, a plastic liner, which you can see here. So there's a metal cup that goes on the socket side and a plastic liner. And then on the stem side, there's a titanium stem. And then you put a ball on there. That gets rid of that bone on bone. It makes it very smooth. So traditionally, what would wear out with the hip replacement would be that plastic liner. So over time, you know, and back, you know, 20, 30 years ago, the, the polyethylene was not as good as it is today. Mm. And those, those polyethylene particles will kind of break off, they cause inflammation in the joint, and then you would have to do a revision to change that out. So a little bit of time ago, the thought was to get rid of the plastic and the hip would last forever. And I'm sure everybody's heard of somebody who had a metal on metal hip. There was no plastic liner. It was smooth, but what happened is you had metal particles breaking off. That caused more problems than the polyethylene. So now we're kind of back, we're shifting back to the polyethylene. We do have another option for the head surface, which is ceramic. And the ceramic is a little bit smoother than the metal, so it causes less wear on the polyethylene. So the technology has improved the polyethylene. We also have the option of having a ceramic head. So that's so kind of gotten rid of that metal on metal problem. Option of having a ceramic head. Yes. Why not always have a ceramic head? Uh, there's a small percentage of reported in the literature. This is, can, can shatter like glass. Mm -hmm. I've never seen it happen, but it is reported. Mm -hmm. So in a younger patient, we use the ceramic. It's gonna last a little bit longer and younger by age and younger by activity, we kind of make the decision with the patient. So if you're 65, 70, you're very active, I'll do the ceramic. If you're 75, 80, the, the stainless steel head's gonna last the rest of your life. Mm. So that, and that has to do with the cost, you know, and the, the things that regulate, you know, how much we spend on an implant, which is mm. on the, the facility side, not necessarily the surgeon side. Mm. But we do have control over, you know, this patient needs a ceramic. You know, the hospital, if you're doing it on every patient that's 85 years old, the hospital is going to say, 
you know, we need to look at the cost, you know, and the benefit. So we kind of do that every day as far as, you know, what does this patient need? And every patient's a little bit different, you mm -hmm. know. So usually it's 65, 70 is my cutoff where anybody younger than that, ceramic, anybody older mm -hmm. than that, the stainless steel is very satisfactory and has very good long-term results. And the, the polyethylene of years gone by used to wear out. Does the polyethylene here wear out as well? The polyethylene the new... is we're putting in, and this is our newer polyethylene, um, which I'll talk a little bit about the new hip that I was on the design team for, that's a next step hip. Mm -hmm. This polyethylene has vitamin E in the liner. So the vitamin E actually prevents the material from oxidizing. So it prevents it from breaking down. So it lasts a lot longer. And because this one is made in small batches, it's lasting a lot longer in the laboratory tests. Uh, this hip was FDA approved last year, so we've been putting a lot of these in. The other main feature uh, if you look at the back of the cup, it may be hard to see on the camera, but it's a 3D printed titanium cup. So you can change the design and the shape and the porosity of the cup to accommodate the patient's bone. So with the hip replacement, we don't use any cement uh, like we do for a knee replacement. So we're relying on the patient's bone to grow onto this implant. We've designed this hip. It looks exactly like the cancellous bone. So the body's gonna see that, it's gonna grow onto it, and it's going to stay there for years and years and years. So the long-term stability of this 3D printed cup combined with the, the polyethylenes that's performing better than the other polyethylenes on the market is going to be a very long-term hit. So we've been very, very happy with the results so far. So this new product that uh, has the vitamin E, this is the only product that has the vitamin E in it? Uh, a lot of the other companies are doing the vitamin E now too. Mm -hmm. This mm -hmm. polyethylene is made in smaller batches. Mm -hmm. So it's a smaller company, they can control the material that's in the polyethylene. Some of the bigger companies make huge batches of the polyethylene, mm -hmm. and I think that's why it's wearing better in, in the lab test compared to the other polyethylenes. Hmm. You know, the downside to, to that is that, you know, it's a newer hip. We don't have 20-year results like mm -hmm. some of the other companies have. But we took everything, the stuff that we know that would be a problem and prevent the hip from lasting a long time, as a design team, we took every little aspect of it and made it just a little bit better so that now we have a really good hip uh, and we're very happy with the results so far. How long did it take to bring this to the market? It took about four years, mm -hmm. hmm. three to four years. Small batches, that sounds like bourbon. Yeah. Comes in small batches. <laughs> you gotta have the right oak barrels. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's pretty interesting. Um, well, we're going to take a short break, and when we come back, we need to talk more about this. So we'll be back right. in, in just a moment after a quick break. At Joint Implant Surgeons of Florida, Dr. Eichten offers state-of-the-art orthopedic care. Dr. Eichten gives special attention to each patient's condition. He listens closely and offers individualized treatment plans, including physical therapy, injections, regenerative medicine treatments, and surgery. Our patients receive a high level of expertise and service, which is unparalleled in any other orthopedic practice. Find out what sets us apart and where your new joints will take you. Take it from one of our patients. It's been a little over a year since Dr. Eichten replaced my right hip. Uh, in seven to eight weeks, I was golfing and enjoying other outdoor activities. Dr. Eichten and the staff were great to work with, and I'm extremely pleased with the results. Welcome back to Dialogue with the Doctor. Uh, we just took a short break and we're talking with Dr. David Eichten, uh, a practicing orthopedic, uh, board certified orthopedic surgeon who has done a fellowship in joint replacement surgery, both joint replacement for hips and for knees, so he's an expert on this. We just got finished talking about um, hip, hip, hip replacements in general and we just touched on this new product that, that is available, that Dr. Eichten was on the design team to help design this product, so that, that's a big deal. Um, but we would like you to tell us more about this product. Sure. So and you're actually using this product. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. So the patients are doing very well. 
we didn't do any radical uh, changes. The hip replacement surgery is a very successful surgery. Our, our goal was just to make it better and make it last longer. So the, the polyethylene has been a huge, uh, as far as the lab testing, it's performing better. Uh, and then combined with the ceramic head, it's a little bit smoother <coughs> than a stainless steel head. You get a very smooth surface. And there's some studies you know, that are 20 some years out with very little wear in the plastic. So we're thinking that if somebody's in their 30s or 40s, which we do see patients in their 30s and 40s that need hip replacements, we may be able to put this in, have it last 30, 40 years. That's kind of the goal. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, nobody's had it in that long, so we don't know how long it's gonna last. Uh, but the materials and the bone growth that you get from a porous uh, cup that looks like the bone, uh, which before you'd have to just do a, a, a forged cup and you had to put the spray on there. This allows you to change the porosity as you go deeper where there's more cancellous bone to grow in there. So it's been very, very beneficial in that aspect. So it matches the, it's hard to see that on camera, but yeah. the, um, the holes, if you will, and it's just like bone marrow, um, are tighter uh, as you get uh, more shallow and am I saying this correctly and it's more cal uh, more porous as you Correct. get deeper and in in matching that I don't know if this yeah will that's show up better on the, yeah on the it, match, it, it matches the human body and the bone so that the bone actually grows into those uh, porous holes they're better and that's uh, this is manufactured on a 3d printer uh, this this the purple part there is manufactured on a 3D printer. Yeah, I think you're going to see that technology used, and you already have the 3D printers used more and more because you can design the implant, you know, on the computer, and you can change what had to be a, in a mold no longer has to be in a mold, mm -hmm. you know. So it's being applied in different fields as well. A lot more. It's called additive manufacturing or 3D manufacturing. Additive manufacturing? Mm -hmm. I know you can go to the dentist now and get a 3D uh, right. cap put on your tooth. So um, is there any other, I've, I've not seen 3D printers used in medicine and implants before. Has it been? I think they're starting to use it more and more. Mm -hmm. um, but we're finding that the structural stability is the same through all the FDA testings that, that were mm -hmm. required. Mm -hmm. uh, but we can make it more like the bone. The more we make implants like the bone. You know, we used to use a lot of stainless steel rods. Now we use all titanium. Titanium performs similar to bone. So if it acts like the bone, your body can adapt to it a little bit easier. If you put in, you know, a stiff, you know, stainless steel rod in a fracture, it doesn't heal as good as you do a titanium. It's a little bit softer metal. It's not as rigid and your mm. body accommodates it a little bit better. I see. And that's why we've used more titanium in implants now than we did before. And titanium allows you to do that 3D printing. So even though titanium is supposed to be harder steel, it's more bendable. It's the, the elasticity properties are more similar to bone than, than a stainless steel implant. I get that terminology right. Yeah. I'm glad you put it that way. Yeah. Um, so yeah. uh, tell us a little bit about the type of people ask, patients ask me all the time about um, hip replacement, anterior approach, lateral approach, and um, there's some confusion about that uh, because many of my patients will come in and say this is the best thing since sliced bread, everybody should have this approach, and, and that isn't really the case. So why don't you tell us about these things? So from what I've learned, and I've done pretty much all the approaches uh, throughout my training, you know, you train with different physicians, you do different approaches. And each physician's, you know, approach may be a slightly different, you know, so if you break it up into three, you know, you, there's anterior and posterior. The posterior approach is traditionally the one that people get trained in the most. I was trained in that in my residency. When I came to my fellowship, we did the direct anterior and kind of a modified anterior lateral. When you say lateral approach, if you talk about that in the older terms, they would take the whole side of the femur right here if you look at the side of the femur they would flip that whole thing up to get to the hip and then you would repair that you'd have to wait for that bone to heal 
that's not what's done now. So now you can do a modified, you know, anterior lateral approach. You just split through the front part, you know, 10% of the muscle, you get down to the capsule. It's a safe approach. You're not cutting any of the tissue in the back. The reason that's important, the hips that dislocate or come out of socket are 98% of them or so are posterior approaches. So po most of the hip, dislocation. yeah, posterior dislocation mm -hmm. through a posterior approach. For whatever reason, that tissue gets repaired, but it doesn't heal as good. Mm -hmm. When you come in the front, it heals a lot better. So the direct anterior has been very popular, uh, but there's still a little bit higher complication with that, and that's why I haven't switched my practice totally to direct anterior. Uh, they may recover a little bit sooner, you know, in the first six weeks. At six weeks, there's no difference. Uh, and the complications, we're even seeing dislocations in direct anterior. And a part of that is getting to the femur. It's a more difficult surgery. You have to release more tissue to get to the femur. When you release more tissue, there's more chance that it can dislocate. So if you look at any approach, this is just general, you know, posterior, we still have a lot of surgeons that still do posterior. We still have a lot of surgeons that do direct anterior, anterior lateral. Most patients are gonna do really good. They're going from a bone on bone hip that feels horrible and they can't walk to something that they can walk on. I think the difference comes in that four to five percent complication rate that you would see with the posterior hip. You know, 95%, 95 out of 100 patients are doing awesome. Mm -hmm. You have a small percentage of patients, and I've seen them too, where they have a complication and we have to fix it. So getting that down to less than 1% is my goal, and I think I'm, I can do that better with the anterior lateral approach. Now that we've modified it, we don't take much of the muscle anymore, uh, it's been helpful with recovery and stability. The hip's not gonna come out. You know, I try to dislocate the hip before I close the, the wound in the, in, the, in, in the capsule. I'm trying to get it out and can't get it out. So then I know, and I can sleep good at night knowing that, mm -hmm. you know, my patient's not gonna dislocate. So that's been very helpful. That's why I haven't switched to the, you know, the one that you see a lot of advertising to for the direct anterior. Mm. It's a good approach. Most patients are gonna do good, but there is that 4% or so complications. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a different table that you use for that sometimes. We've seen fractures with that. Uh, sometimes it's hard to see, so they put the wrong size stem in, and I've revised patients for that. So I think over time, you know, you know, any approach from the front is going to be better than an approach from the back. But you still have surgeons that do the posterior approach and the patients do really good. Mm -hmm. It's just getting rid of that small, you know, four to five percent. You want to get that down to less than one percent a complication. So rate. it's the modified anterior approach or yeah. anterior lateral approach. Yeah, the incision's a little bit more lateral. Mm -hmm. There's a nerve that's in the front that sometimes gets cut with the direct anterior mm -hmm. and that can cause numbness down the thigh. I've seen patients with that after they've had the anterior. So I kind of cheat over more lateral. It's not a direct lateral approach. Mm -hmm. So, I, you know, it's kind of anterior lateral. Um, and I kind of go over that with the patients. I'm very honest with them. I don't want them to, you know, there's more complications with certain procedures. And that, that's to be said too with, with the surgeon. You know, some surgeons are very good and they can do any approach and the patient mm -hmm. would do great. So you just have to, you know, if you're going to do that, you know, the anterior, direct anterior, just make sure the surgeon's done a lot of them. Even the surgeons that have done a lot of them, you can see, you know, complications. And that's reported in the literature. And mm -hmm. some of the best surgeons in the country that do that approach, mm -hmm. complications about 4%. So that's why I haven't switched totally to the, to the, the direct anterior. Mm. So. Well, only time will tell that mm -hmm. in terms of it makes sense. You have less... Uh, you have those complications, that's the only way to go. Right, I think that's best for the patient. Mm -hmm. Let everything heal, let the bone grow in. At six weeks, you can do whatever you want. There's no restrictions. You can cross your legs over, you can bend down. Once the capsule heals, you can, there's no restrictions on an anterior lateral hip. Because I'm not worried about dislocating. I couldn't get it out while you were asleep. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. not coming out. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's very, very stable. So uh, what's the recovery like, or how long are patients in the hospital? Everybody's recovery is a little bit different. Most of the patients are going home the next day. We wanna make sure they're safe walking with therapy. Once they're safe uh, and they're, you know, we check their hemoglobin and all their blood pressure and everything. Once they're safe to go home, 
they usually go home the, the next day. Uh, and what will happen is home health will kind of help transition them. Uh, and then you can do outpatient therapy. So the therapy for the hip is a little bit easier than, than a knee. And you're mainly just walking uh, and getting your strength back. And once you realize that that arthritic pain is gone, the patients recover really quickly for a hip compared to a, to a knee. What, what uh, in, in your patients, recovery depends on the health of the patient. If you have somebody Correct. who's you know, very old or debilitated, it's different. What age do you see people getting hip replacements at? And has that changed over time? I think uh, my youngest patient is in their mid-30s. Mm. You know, and there's various reasons for that. Um, oldest patient, it was 96. Mm -hmm. So very healthy, active. She couldn't walk anymore. She wanted to walk. Mm. She did great. So I don't limit, you know, who can and can't get one. Mm. We want to make sure it's safe. You know, so we try as much non-operative as you can. But uh, we see it in a, a lot of younger patients as well, 50s, 60s, uh, you know, and 70s that, that require hip replacement. And patients do very well with hip replacements. You know, they come in and they're four week follow up and they have no pain. You know, they're carrying the cane in just to carry it um, <laughs> to show that they had it. You know, and I'm, I tend to be a little bit more conservative as far as using something in the beginning, let it heal, make sure you don't fall, you know, and making sure that everything goes good the first four to six weeks. After that, there's no restrictions. And you have physical therapy on site in your office? Correct, we have therapists in our office, both in Naples and in Fort Myers, and that's very helpful. They know our protocols. Uh, they can get you recovered very quickly. They've seen it a hundred, hundreds of times, so they know the kind of questions that the patients ask. I think patients having the knowledge of what to expect really decreases their anxiety and helps them recover from the hip replacement. You hear a lot of things, there's a lot of different places you can look for information now. Uh, so having you know, a stepwise approach and you know, somebody following along that can answer your questions quickly and reassure the patient, mm -hmm. the recovery is better. People want to stay in one place. They don't want to go to multiple locations. They can see you or Correct. see the hand specialist or the, the, the pain management physiatry Correct. person and the physical therapist. They know your staff already. They know you. It's, they, it's, a, it's a trust issue. Yeah, I think it's easier. So, Correct. Yeah. Well, we want to thank you for being here and coming to talk to us. And um, we learned a lot. I know I learned a lot. And I appreciate it. We'd love to have you come back and do it again. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Thanks for your time.